welcome to the 19th episode of the 6th season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 3rd of July and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on our website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me this week are Alan. Hello. Tony. Good evening. And Mark. Hiya. (laughs) It's always one. So annoying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So how are we this evening? Diggity boo. Yeah. Excellent. It's been a nice day. Reasonably good weather. Mm, My sunburn's recovered. Excellent. Oh yes, so it has. (laughs) It's less of a glow. (laughs) I nearly didn't recognise you when you came in the house, but fortunately, I did. Good. Anyhow, let's let's get on with the show. For the news when Tony fades me up. <laughs> Our first news <laughs> item. You were the one busy clanking crockery around. <laughs> I was turning the clock over. Oh dear. Uh, Microsoft have backpedaled on their Xbox One DRM uh, following customer backlash. Mm, yes, lots of people on the internet were annoyed. Yes, people in, were un- angry. uncharacteristically. Yes. So they had they had a, they launched this new console and loads of rumours flew about and. And then it was confirmed that the uh, the console would not allow you to play used games. Yeah, so you mm. couldn't you couldn't buy a game on disc and then sell it to someone else, basically, yes. because it wouldn't. It would say no. This disc has already been played on another console, and mm. you wouldn't be able to play the console if you were completely offline. It would yeah. have to check in with phone home like periodically. They said something like once every 24 hours mm. and the internet went nuts. Yeah. <laughs> completely bonkers. Um, especially, you know, gamers who have already bought into, you know, a console and, uh, mm. you know, are looking to the next console to buy and they make a commitment. A lot of them either one console or another. And it's these kind of decisions that help sway their decision making process. Because consoles last for a long time, don't they? Well, they can do, and and some people like keep their consoles around and, yeah. can, and replay. Especially if you then have kids. Like I'm digging out old games and, and playing them with my kids. Hmm. And if if they make it so that I I have to stay online and I'm reliant on some server somewhere that you know I can't necessarily connect to anymore. And other people, you know, they they play their games. Um, uh, in totally disconnected environments. And the, the scenario that was thrown at one of the Microsoft guys was, what about our military personnel in a submarine? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good point. Yeah. Or, or a military out, uh, posted in like foreign lands where they don't have a very reliable connection. Yeah. You know, mm. it's, uh, but anyway, they've, they've, uh, they've reneged on this and backed down and said, okay, Excellent. you can play. Games they did it for our boys. In. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, their boys. Yeah, yes, some boys. Um, yeah. In other news, Richard Stallman has been inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. I didn't know that the Internet Hall of Fame was a thing. No, it, it seems it's been going since last year. Ah, right. it, makes, oh. it makes me think of the... Um, <laughs> the Internet Hall of Obscurity. <laughs> what's, what's that uh, TV show with Bender? Uh, Fut- Futurama. Futurama with all the heads <laughs> in, in jars. Um, Yes, but well, I think Richard Storman is hanging on to his for now. Um, <laughs> but his entry falls under the innovators category, along with the creator of Mosaic, one of the first web browsers, uh, one of the Electronic Frontier Foundation co-founders, and Jimmy Wales of Wikipedia. He's the sad man who appears in the banner at the top sometimes <laughs> on Wikipedia. The man looking sad, really as winning. opposed to the sad man. Yes. Well, yeah, potato, potato. potato. It's a, I can I can kind of see why Richard Storman has been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mm. I'm uh, kind of surprised that it was him and not Linus. Mm. Yeah. I mean, okay, he's the... Richard is the spiritual leader of free software, I guess. Yeah. He's um, not the obvious creator, though, is he? No, well, well... Not anymore, that's the thing. I mean, back in the day... Mm. Yeah, he did Emacs. Fair enough, but these days, he just shouts. And interestingly... The innovation, he was actually, he didn't innovate and he didn't create something new. He did, mm. he created the free software, but it was a continuation of the way the software had always been for him. Mm. So he helped create a license to preserve the way rather than saying we should do it 
this way around and yeah, give it all yeah, away. Yeah. yeah. Um, but whereas Linus obviously was key in, in inventing the Linux kernel. Well, but, you know, and arguably he was trying to just, a- simulate yeah, Minix, Minix on his or Unix environment on his home computer. True. So there's nothing new. <laughs> yeah, he innovated by giving it away. Mm. Nothing's ever new. Nothing's ever new, yeah. Nothing, nothing at all. I'm kind of curious if there's an innovators category, what the other categories are on the Internet Hall of Fame. Um, trolls, porn stars, <laughs> you know, meaningless <laughs> Tumblr accounts. What's the... Podcasts. Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get your hopes up, Tony, <laughs> on any of those categories. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, Google Plus Hangouts now features remote desktop support. Ooh! Yeah. So you can you can steal control of someone else's computer via Google Hangouts with their yep. consent. Oh, of course. And if they have the plugin installed, and right. if you do as oh, well, okay. And it all works, and the planets are aligned. Uh, I think it's pretty. Can you get the for Linux? Hangout yes. is pretty good, actually. Ah. It works quite well. Yeah, so basically, for Hangouts, we I mean we use Hangouts at work a lot, um, and. Uh, it allows you to have like a multi-person um, video chat, yeah, which um, is like doesn't unless you pay, right? Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's all free uh, once you've signed your soul away to Google uh, for a Google account. Um, but they've added this feature that lets you uh, request access to the other person's screen. Now they've already got screen sharing, yeah. where you can you can say I would like to share my screen with everyone else on the call, so they can see what you're doing. Yes, yeah, so if you want to present something or demo something, and we use that quite a lot. But this is the other way around. You're yeah. requesting access to control someone else's machine, and they have to accept. And then you know, just like you know, Team Viewer or mm. VNC or something like that, mm. but. The the reason I thought this was noteworthy is because it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, it means that you can very easily support another member of the family. All they've got to do is just go to you know, the mm. Google Plus thing and join you in a Hangout, and you're done. It's, it's pretty pretty cool. Cool. I shall have to try one of these Hangouts one day. Yes. Join us in the 21st century, Tony. <laughs> Everyone's favourite tax, uh, tax dodgers, Amazon, have brought their auto rip service to the UK. This is pretty cool. So mm. this means that if you've basically if you've ever bought a CD from Amazon of the three hundred fifty thousand, which is supported by the service, mm. then you can go. Yes, I'd like that in MP3 as well, and download it all, and you don't have to pay again. Mm. Even if you bought it as a gift for somebody else, I believe so. <laughs> so it, all you do is get, log into Amazon and click the auto rip button, and, it, and then you you know you accept the terms and conditions, and then it does a scanning thing and sits there for a while, and then says, "Ha ha, I found all this music." What, wow. that you've bought in the past i did it on um on my amazon account and um lots of black lace was it? <laughs> yeah we'll get a lot of cliff richard yeah, well it's funny yeah. you should say that uh actually it found one cd uh <laughs> which i bought as a present for someone else hmm. um and oh, it was 20, was 29 tracks and that was it and that's the yeah. only thing it found oh. so i clearly don't buy music from amazon oh, 29 tracks is a, a fair number 29 singles. Album. Oh, no, it was a double, it was double, a double CD yeah, thing. Double album. Yeah. Now 83. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a present for someone else. It's not even something I would have bought. Mm. It'd be really cool to have this for books. If yes. you bought a book and you also got the ebook. Yeah. That yeah. would be really cool. That would be really good. You Which get you... this from Big Finish, don't you? Yes, I bought a couple of books from, from Big Finish recently and I got an ebook version with them. Oh, that's right, cool. in, my, in my Big Finish account, having bought the, the physical copy. Yeah. Could you get that for the the, radio, the audio books anyway, don't you? If you yes. buy the CDs. If you buy the CD, the, you get a download version. So. But that's that's when you buy, like, that. that's going forward. This, yes. The auto rip yeah. is a retrospective thing that they've done. Yes. I so, looked at it on mine and I had the, uh, an album from 2000 or something from the, the, I bought in 2000, which was Travis. Right. Was that a present for someone else? No, I think it's actually mine. Although I couldn't lay my hands on it. (laughs) Hey, it was a sad period of time. From after 1940. Well done. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, In graphics stack news, uh, (laughs) yes, it's been announced uh, the plans for uh, the graphics stack in Ubuntu uh, for 1304 and, uh, sorry, 1310 and 1404 and beyond. Including Ooh. Mia, XMIA, and uh, Unity 7, 8, and so on. So XMIA is the thing we mentioned before, which is going to let you run existing X Windows apps on the new Mia compositor. Yes. Right. And uh, so Ollie uh, 
uh, who works for Canonicle, posted uh, a blog post and sent a mail to the the uh, Ubuntu Devil mailing list, mm-hmm. um, inviting discussion, but also to say these are our plans. This is what we're we're thinking. Cool. So, and there's been some some um, posts about getting the various flavors of Ubuntu, like Lubuntu and X Ubuntu, running on Xmere as well. Yeah. So Ollie's post is about what we're doing in Ubuntu. Yeah. And um, obviously the flavors get to make their own decisions about what they do because mm. you know they choose what desktop they want, they choose what apps they want. Some of the bits underneath that, they're kind of reliant on Ubuntu. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they generally make their own decisions. And, um, yeah, they've been vocal in making yeah. their decisions. Ubuntu in particular have said they are not going to use Xmir. Yeah, that was kind of disappointing, actually, because uh, Riddell posted his... Uh, he, I mean, we, we spoke to all the leads... Uh, of those projects and gave them a heads up to say look this is these are our plans this is what we're going to do for the next year um so that you know you know what's going to happen and uh jonathan from kubuntu posted his blog post late at night before ollie had publicly announced that this is what we're going to do and he posts his blog post saying kubuntu's not switching to mir um which kind of was a bit daft, I think. But, um, uh, but you know, they wanted to announce it. They wanted to be clear to their users and upstream what they were doing. So, Mia, to ordinary people who were just using it, what difference will they see? Eventually, none. <laughs> well, it, oh, I thought you were going to say be... eventually loads. <laughs> well, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's a plumbing thing. It's That's like, what I was wondering. It's, it's like when the world's shifted from X386 to Xorg. Mm. You know, but there should yes, be, there should a, be some pump. differences like you know, smoother transition from boot to desktop, I would hope. Yeah. Uh, one of, one of the thing one of the things that they will notice, yeah, is in theory from, you know, switching it on, you don't get a flicker, um, between changing screen modes, mm-hmm. but that's, you know, from, from a day to day point of view, that's, that's not like a dramatic, it's right. not like there's going to be suddenly something dramatically that changes in, that's what in, I was in Mir. So, um, no, it's, it's mostly about, um, you know, the future and, so, moving away from X. So it won't be as dra- mm. dramatic as getting things like wobbly windows. And... <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> it's worth a read, though. There's a there's an awful lot of posts on it. There's um, Pharonix have already done some benchmarks on it, and uh, Ollie's written a couple of blog posts about um, benchmarking. We, we've been doing benchmarking as well uh, internally, so you know we're we're aware of the performance issue that that uh, Pharonix brought up. So um, yeah, it's good. Cool. A security researcher at Carnegie Mellon University, which I believe is a real university, um, ha- has reported 1,200 crashes, that's 1.2 thousand in decimal, um, in Debian Wheezy binaries. What, in one day? Um, yeah, he used a tool to generate right. these crashes. You, you can't crash Debian that quickly. It wasn't like manually. Firefox just crashing repeatedly on him 1,200 times. No, this was right. diff- different packages. He tested, I think, something like 23,000 packages, and in that he got 1.2 thousand um, <laughs> so report two point three thousand packages, and he got <laughs> <laughs> so he got lots of crashes, lots and of crashes and to report them. Yes, yeah, so he emailed emailed the one of the Debian lists and said, um, "I've got a lot of reports to file, but I don't want to just throw them all at you at once. What's the best thing to do?" That's a really Which nice thing nice. to do, isn't it? Yes. What, awesome. what did they say? Um, take them and right, thanks, them. Thanks very much. We really appreciate you not just throwing us 1,200 bugs or 1.2 thousand bugs or whatever you want to call it. Pipe them to Dev Null. Yeah. But it's an interesting read and it's, it's, it's a good way to show that, you know, people are contributing to Debian and that that benefit will be seen by, you know, lots of other people. Ubuntu, you know, Mint and hmm. loads of other, and no doubt that will all go upstream as well. So, you know, everyone wins. Brill. Cool. Hardware.info have been testing a pair of Samsung SSDs to destruction um, because yes. they're, they're guaranteed for a thousand read write cycles across the whole device, but the test showed them to survive three times that long. Yeah, I think they've got some, there's like some new chip that they've got in which they wanted to test to see if they were in like any better or worse than the previous technology. And they found, yeah, they ran a test for two months, basically just constantly writing and writing and writing and writing to these disks. Um, and the first drive, the, I think the second drive they said is still running, just. And the first drive failed. It started to show that it was failing after they wrote 707 terabytes of data and failed after 888 terabytes of data. 
had been wow. written to it. They should, they should have put like a webcam on it and put they, it they online. Did, yes. I did, though. It was live streamed. <laughs> oh, was it? They I live streamed it, yeah. See, I just know these things too well. <laughs> but the, the thing that I found interesting about this was because people are often reluctant to get an SSD because there's this long-held belief that SSDs are unreliable and they'll all fail and yeah. you lose all your data. Um, and... Uh, yeah, okay, it's hardware, it can fail. But they were just trying to show, at least in part, that it's possible for these things to actually last longer than the manufacturer says yeah. you know, the, the life cycle of the thing is. It's a phenomenal amount of data they threw at these discs. Yeah. And one, one interesting thing they found out was that, um, so the, the wear levelling algorithm, which is supposed to move data between the different physical bits of the disc so that one bit doesn't get worn down by being mm. rewritten it also applies if you just leave some data on the disc then it will still move it around as other things get rewritten so that you don't end up with one really good part of the disc which has had the same data on it forever and other bits getting really worn out it still applies across which wow. is one of the ways it keeps it going so if you're watching them on a webcam, what do they do? Cause <laughs> Flash. When, when I, oh, fly, yeah, okay. Because when I was imagining that, I was thinking of them going... Tick, 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 because they no, won't because they're SSDs and they're not going to fly up the Imperial theme or anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or burst into flames in a spectacular oh, fashion. Oh, that Yeah. Douglas Engelbert died last night. We are sorry to announce, but who was he? He invented the computer mouse. Oh. A whole bunch of human-computer interaction stuff. And apparently, his, I'm quoting this from the article, his research and efforts led to the development of a diverse set of technologies such as hypertext, network, networked computers and the graphical user interface. Well, well. I vaguely think he wrote an article for me. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I might be lying. Which Maybe somebody first, wrote an article on him. The pointer or the mouse? Oh, that's a very good existential question, <laughs> which we haven't got time to answer this evening. It good. was a block of wood. <laughs> Okay, yes. but a big contribution to computing, sir. Well done, yes. Douglas. Yes, and our final news: something that uh, Tony will be very excited about. I'm all ears. Uh, Google. It's a rumor that Google are developing an Android-based games console. Fantastic. So, as our resident games reporter, we would like to get your opinion and and how how that will affect the Ouya and uh, the Game Stick and and other popular. And do you game think consoles? Apple might be coming along with their with their answer to the? Uh, like small factor games console soon um yeah i think it will affect all of those things and how do you um, think it will change your life uh, I, well it would have changed my life if they could invent a games console that played the games itself so i didn't have to bother that would be ideal except the so simpsons how, how much of the time do you spend on that simpsons game not all of the time <laughs> surprising <laughs> amount for somebody who doesn't play games yeah it's not a game it's just control over people <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right, a quick comment from uh, Red Tape Renegade, who's listening to the live stream in our IRC channel. He says he loves handing out. He talked to an Ubuntu developer on one, and he's a complete idiot. <laughs> Presum- right. Hang on. Which one? <laughs> I Him think he's or the Ubuntu he, developer? Uh, he is a complete idiot, not, not the, the Ubuntu developer. developer. Right. But those okay. are his own words, so he can't sue me. And uh, yeah, that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. It's time for our Ubuntu community news now, and Alexander Hanf posted to the Ubuntu Devel Discuss list, proposing a change to Ubuntu's default search engine. Oh, oh, did he propose we change it to Bing? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah DuckDuckGo. No, it wasn't no. DuckDuckGo. It was uh, Yahoo. No. Nope. Start page. What? Who? Huh? <laughs> Which is, a uh, um, well, in the, same way, in the same way that DuckDuckGo is a sort of privacy-enhanced front for Bing, um, search page start page sorry is a privacy enhanced front for google how do they enhance my privacy by um i think they they don't track your searches through the site and therefore google knows it's them that's forwarding the search but they don't know who the search is coming from so they're not tracking your search and i think they they also they have the option for more privacy like they'll do a proxy connection from them through to google as well in some cases 
Okay. And so Alexander proposed that uh, in order to enhance the uh, privacy of our user base, that we should change the default search engine from Google to StartPage for yes. all our users. Um, partly why StartPage in particular, not DuckDuckGo, who are also quite popular, is that Start StartPage is based in the Netherlands, whereas DuckDuckGo is based in the US. So, uh, And we've seen that the US has no influence whatsoever over European countries mm-hmm. after seeing the Bolivian well, no, Prime Minister diverted after two air, uh, two countries shut their airspace this week. It's, uh, uh, his, his concern is that even though DuckDuckGo says they don't track you, they may still be compelled by US legislation to collect track some you. data about you and not say they... Sh- Tra- they collect data about you, whereas right. the laws in the Netherlands don't aren't quite as bad. So, what did the other devils say? It kind of went a bit quiet. It didn't. It, uh, yeah, I, I I thought it would get a fair bit of conversation going about the pros and cons, but actually, it, the thread kind of died. There's a financial implication, isn't there? Chronicle will get a kickback from Google yes. for having that as a default search engine. Yes, so, but presumably they wouldn't do for. All well, any alternative. Duck, I, duck, go I don't whatever. know what the the financial side of Start Page is. I don't yeah. know whether they get revenue for pushing people towards Google and therefore they can pass that on to customers. I don't know. But mm. the thread kind of died a death, so it's a bit of a shame. Fair enough. A Juju charm competition has been launched, offering $10,000 for the most innovative charm. Mm. Ooh, that's charming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so, for that input there. A week. quick recap, what's the charm? So Juju is like apt get for the cloud. We've ah. spoken to George Castro before we about have. Juju. And so you could Juju deploy some amazing cloud application that you use to run your your business or whatever using Juju and scale out to hundreds of nodes if you wanted to. Um, this is on Ubuntu cloud. Yeah, on a cloud. It could be and running Ubuntu or it could potentially be running something else. Um and charms are like the packages that you install. So you could have a charm for Hadoop or a charm for WordPress and a charm for My uh, MySQL. And so a charm, it, you can read app. Yes, yes. effectively. Well, but you can, you can make kind of uh, more, more complex charms that pull in lots of different apps. And so the competition okay. is to try and motivate people to create charms which are complicated innovative you know clever in some way and enable cloud deployments of you know some funky application whatever it may be cool. details on the website Brill. mark shotworth has blogged about the carrier advisory group mm. who are they then so it's a it's a group chaired by an independent person mm-hmm. uh and it's a bunch of carriers from around the world. These mobile phone network mobile phone providers. network operator carriers, yes. yes. And uh, they are they get together on a regular basis with Canonical and talk about uh, Ubuntu phone. So this is a way of making sure that when Ubuntu Touch is ready to ship on a phone, that it's in a state which is actually of interest to the people who are going to be putting the packages together. Yeah. So, so over the last like six months, Mark Shuttleworth has been travelling around to all parts of the world, talking to carriers, mm-hmm. and he's been having meetings with them. And um, they've been giving us a lot of input about you know things we should do before they would consider deploying an Ubuntu phone. Yeah. Um, and rather than have lots of those individual conversations all around the place, he thought it would be a good idea to have an advisory group, a panel, representing those who have an interest in uh, putting Ubuntu on a phone. And they get a benefit in that they get exclusivity if they join the carrier advisory group. Ah. And over the last couple of weeks, Mark's been blogging about and mentioning on Google Plus and Facebook and other uh, Twitter and other places that, that various carriers have joined the advisory group from right. all around the world. Which is cool, good. and lots of I mean, literally it is a global thing. Mm. There's people from other all sorts of countries popping. Yeah, up I think on that today list. another one uh, joined from uh, Indonesia, so it's like you know, yeah. the, 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 one of the things that's that I've noticed is um, people tend to be very interested in the carriers where they live. Obviously, yeah, you yeah. Know, because you know, I I want Orange, Vodafone, you know, T-Mobile or whatever, and people in the US want Sprint, Verizon, and and so they're, they're everyone's championing their own networks, but really it needs just a core set of 
um, very dedicated carriers, wherever they are in the world, to deploy this so that we can get the first version out and, right. um, you know, uh, move on from there. I don't think we necess- the carrier advisory group doesn't need to have every network in every country. That's not the point of it. Um, just a few dedicated uh, carriers. Mm. That's what they've got. Excellent. Oh, it's my turn, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd finished speaking. Um, and <laughs> never. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, such hard work when you're not here. We also have a, a blog post from uh, Victor Palau, uh, who's written about achieving differentiation on Ubuntu Touch. So related to that, about how we uh, differentiate, um, how carriers can differentiate what they deliver. So uh, how the they can stick in uh, their own horrible apps, which are <laughs> you immediately try. Well, that's exactly what it's about. <laughs> that's exactly what the blog post talks about. Is the the worst thing about carriers is the is the fact that they all slap their horrible stuff on top of Android at the moment. Yeah, and you know it it leads to this horrid fragmentation and um, yeah. So it's this. how to how to give them something attractive while not screwing over the users by giving them a bad experience. Exactly. And it talks about how we can build it from the start with that uh, differentiation and customization built in. Right. Brill. Ollie Rees has blogged about the first independent benchmarks for Mir, the exciting graphics stack that we talked about earlier in the show. Um, they've been published by Pharonix, who do a lot of benchmarks. Mm. Yes. And what have we learned from the benchmarks? I think there were some of the performance showed like a ten percent degradation um, or thereabouts. Yeah, well, compared using, to running on X, running on standard X, yeah, that's right. Probably now. what you'd expect, isn't it? Well, for something that we've just put out, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, you know, it, and there was a there was a hangout a couple of uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, where Ollie and a whole bunch of engineers were taking questions from um, uh, interested parties. Um, and they were talking about, you know, whether whether we can get that that uh, performance loss, you know, down to zero, and whether it can be exactly the same. And one of the interesting points that uh, Chris House Rogers, who's one of our uh, engineers, said was, um, "What's what's interesting to note is when you're doing benchmarks, if you're benchmarking something like OpenGL performance, yeah." That's not actually what most people use their computer for, their desktop. Mm. O- raw OpenGL frame rate is not vital for paging down in no. a document no. and opening applications and moving windows around. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a factor, but the average user wouldn't notice that 10% degradation right. is what they're asserting. Okay. And obviously, they want to try and get that down. So it's yeah. not 10%. It's like lower than that. But um, it's not as bad as it's necessarily painted. Mm. Fair enough. And finally. And finally, in Not About Ubuntu, Fedora 19 is out. Ooh, excellent. Well done, the Fedora project. Schrodinger's cat. Ah, what about it? That's the code name for Ah, Fedora 19. Do we know what Fedora 20 is called yet? Uh, I don't know, actually. (laughs) More on that next week. Hopefully, yeah. Well, Fedora 19 has um, GNOME version 3.8. Oh. Some new applications such as a clock. <laughs> it says in the release. It's all clock. very exciting. Is it turning into KDE? Has it got another calculator? Uh, yes, to all of the above. Um, <laughs> you can have classic mode, and there's also a mate uh, environment. So you can right. run old version of GNOME that doesn't work anymore. So there's two old versions hmm. of GNOME. Yeah. Uh, okay. All, it has all of the old versions of GNOME in. Wow. Um, in any possible combination. Good. And KDE Plasma Workspace is 4.10. Right. right. Um, but there are some events that we're going to tell you about. Yes, we are. They're coming up now. Um, there's an augmented reality for Android with OpenStreetMap event. Um, it's a BCS event happening at Southampton Solent University on a date, which I'm about to tell you. Uh, if what date just... would that be then, Mark? Um, well, you know, the thing about dates is there's so many of them, it can be hard to fill in the time I until think it's you've probably got it on your screen. It's I think soon, it's it? on the... It's the 4th of July, which is tomorrow, tomorrow um, at 6pm. Excellent. Well done, us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cracking a bit of plan in there. <laughs> yeah, we're really smooth, aren't we? The next one's even better because it's just a URL and has no details it's at all. It's called Campus Party, and I was loading the page while we spoke. <laughs> <laughs> and not half an hour ago. And it doesn't say we'll where We'll have a link is. in the show notes. <sighs> it's probably last week. Okay, good. <laughs> The next event we do know all about because it's one of my events. Um, oh, good. Uh, 
uh, Open Source Junction 5, which is looking at open source in the public sector, is happening at uh, the University Club in Oxford on the 18th and 19th of this month. So that's in just a couple of weeks. Uh, basically, we're going to get together a bunch of people who are interested in finding out more about open source in the public sector and what solutions are available and where you can get them from and who's been doing things and what you can learn from them. So if you work in IT in the public sector and you want to know more about open source, it's free for public sector people and you can sign up at osj5.eventbrite.co.uk. I think that makes up for the uh, two that we knew nothing about. Mm. Uh, finally, there's OgCamp. Yay! The country's premier open source and... Slash only techie event <gasps> should get but we don't think about that either yet. the 19th and 20th of october at liverpool john moore's university in liverpool and we're looking for people to sign up uh, to join the crew mm. uh, we'll put a link to the form in the uh, show notes if you're interested in helping out the crew are basically the people who make all camp happen we just yes. sort of we just sort of get some people in the building, but they're the they're the real stars of the we show. We don't really even do that. We sit and talk about Og Camp every two weeks yeah. on the podcast, and then turn up. So if you are, <laughs> if you're in any some of us do anyway. Well, so if you are, would like to help out, you don't need to have any particular skills. Um, if if you've got a pair of hands that can carry boxes around, that's useful. But if you yeah. have got AV skills or something like that, that's also useful to know about. Or if you've just got a lot of enthusiasm, yeah. We'd love to hear from you and uh, send you over to Big Les Pounder and he will uh, point you in the right direction. And give you a free T-shirt. And that's all for this episode. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing Barney Brown from Intercontinental Music Lab, reading your feedback and making your life a little bit easier with some command line no graphical love. <laughs> You'll have to wait and see till next week. Oh dear. A whole week to work out whether that's a good answer to that question or not. Yeah. Spoiler, it's command line love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I went to bother. <laughs> <laughs> I won't bother coming next week then. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I will. Find out next time. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.